Good morning, and uh, thank you to the moderators for inviting me. Um, can you put up the slides? So I'm going to talk about electrical stimulation in uh, metabolic disease. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, my disclosures, um, I'm a founder of a small company that hasn't done anything yet. Um, <laughs> I'm on the Data Safety Monitoring Board for Baranova, and uh, for Valentex, I'm on the Medical Advisory Board. So I don't think any of those conflict with this. The other thing I should mention is that none of the technologies I'm going to discuss today, other than the V-Block from Maestro, is FDA approved. So this is all historical or, or up and coming. When we think about electrical stimulation of the GI tract anyway, um, most people think of it as gastric stimulation. With the B-block, it's the vagus nerves, but really stimulation can happen anywhere along the GI tract. In the stomach, the initial thought was that we were affecting motility. Is this a pacemaker where we're um, stimulating the stomach to empty? In fact, we may be slowing the stomach from emptying, and these are some of the mechanisms by which, which this can work. Um, most of the studies don't show that we're actually pacing the stomach to control emptying in a, in a forward fashion, but actually the slowing of the emptying in reverse peristalsis seems to be more of an effect or stimulating the intensity of contractions. A lot of this is really unknown as far as what the specific mechanisms are for specific devices, although again, as I'll show with the V-block, that the suggestion is that it's a blockage of the vagus nerve afferents and efferents. Um, the afferents sensitivity signals back to the brain. The efferents have multiple effects on motility, distensibility of the stomach, even hormone and, and uh, uh, enzyme production. So the thing about electrical stimulation is you can change where you're putting the stimulation. You can change the voltage or power that you're applying, the frequency that you're applying as far as the waveform. That can be square, sine waves, et cetera. You can have multiple periods of time off, time on. And uh, Really, there's infinite combinations of what you can do with the electrical stimulation. It's, none of this is applying a continuous direct current to the, to the tissues. And so the two things that have been studied the most <coughs> have been short pulse width, high frequency, or long pulse width, low frequency, it's sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. And some of these are thought more to affect stimulation of motility or blockage or activation of nerve fibers. The other thing about this is there are no clearly defined measurable physiologic endpoints other than what you're after, I guess, which is weight loss or the hemoglobin A1C. Nobody is really studying this and showing, well, we somehow augmented or slowed emptying of the stomach in a significant way. It's not like an EKG where you can look at the pulse waves and, and now you have a more rapid you know, heart rate. Um, there's electrogastrograms, but they're very, very difficult to interpret and not always directly correlating with this anyway. And it, when it comes to vagal nerve blocking, there's really no specific test you can look at to say this nerve has been blocked or this nerve has not been blocked. This originally started with, as far as I know, with um, is in the late 90s with a device that was ultimately sold to Medtronic and not in clinical use called the um, implantable gastric stimulator or IGS. Just to look back for a second, these are just like pacemakers you can see here. Um, all the devices are a little metal box that goes under the skin. We used these harpoon needles way back when to put the leads in. They've gotten a lot more sophisticated. And then a magnetic device that speaks to the stimulator that's under the skin. And these giant electrodes were placed on the lesser curve of the stomach between the body and the antrum. It was a continuous stimulation, so it wasn't on and off over long periods of time, but it was several seconds with breaks in between. Um, and you can see here, it's this high frequency. Um, and this sham control trial was finally done in the US. Before the sham control trial, there were hundreds of patients around the world and you know, wonderful effectiveness. Comes to the US, 300 patients studied in several different trials. Ultimately, um, we saw 35% excess weight loss for patients who responded, but only about a third of patients had response. In the patients that responded, their weight loss was maintained until the battery went dead, which unfortunately sometimes was a year or two. And then a large prospective randomized control trial didn't show benefit. Uh, that went backwards. So the randomized placebo control trial pretty much showed, as you can see here, no difference between the groups. And in this trial, the Barrow screen, which was actually a 
retrospective look back at the other trials to try and pick out the patients that would respond or had responded and go forward to see who would respond. Even in that carefully selected subgroup, we didn't see a big difference. On the other hand, I think this trial, maybe had it been done these days, showing a quarter of patients losing 20% of their excess weight, um, which is a significant increase. It's more than 10% over sham, might have passed today's FDA. Uh, it's not totally clear um, that this is a failed thing um, in, in retrospect. Another company doing a similar trial um, with a different device. This device has six electrodes. You can see here there's um, six ports. Two go on the front of the stomach in the antrum, two on the back of the antrum, and two up in the fundus. And this is both sensing and stimulation. The other interesting thing about this device is that this external pad charges the device so that this battery issue is, is not there, traded off for an issue where the patient actually has to sit down for 45 minutes a couple times a week and stimulate the device. And this is intermittent stimulation. The device is activated by food intake. So when the food comes into the stomach, the distension separating the antral leads stimulates the device to start sending signals. And the goal here is to enhance gastric contraction and also cause distension of the proximal stomach. The other interesting thing about this device is it can also measure physical activity. It has an accelerometer in it. Um, and here's a trial that was reported in the literature of 61 patients, both diabetic and overweight. And this mostly, this has been focused on diabetes outcome. That's why I put in the title metabolic, although there, there is weight loss. Um, and you can see here the decrease in hemoglobin A1C in patients, and the, these numbers represent the number of patients that have followed out that far. But a decrease in hemoglobin A1C from 8.2 down to just a little over 7, 7.2, that seems to be maintained over the course of time that the device is in. Now, if you look here in the, in the patients, their glucose went down, their hemoglobin A1C went down, um, hypertension is improved. But then you look at the weight, there wasn't a lot of weight loss. Uh, it wasn't statistically significant. And so there's some weight loss, but it seems that um, this may be an independent effect. Maybe the type of food that patients eat, maybe how much they're eating at one time that allows their insulin that they can produce to take care of that am amount that they're eating at that specific time. But overall, the calorie input might not be that different. This is another interesting device um, called Ability by Interpace. They've been working on uh, various m versions of this for a long time. But again, an, an electrical stimulator here um, looks like many of the others. The difference about this is it actually has a transgastric sensor. This device goes into the lumen of the stomach and that um, detects when food comes in and stimulates only during that time as opposed to the last device where it was separation of the electrodes by distension of the stomach. And I'm sorry, this is the device with the accelerometer. Um, it actually can measure how much exercise the patient is doing here, um, telling you about light, moderate, or vigorous exercise. And here you can actually graph activity when you talk to the device through that magnetic um, communication. You can look at it by day, and it records all those things. And here's um, meals. You actually, with this device, set times when you're allowed to be eating, and you don't stimulate during those times, and you get noxious stimuli potentially if you're eating outside those allowed windows. So here's 34 patients, average BMI of 32. The leads go near the crow's foot. As I showed you in the picture, the center goes up in the fundus. Here's the stimulation parameters. And 28% excess weight loss at 12 months. Only 16 of the patients who were followed to 27 months um, out of the whole 34, and they had a maintained weight loss during that period of time of 27% excess weight loss. Again, this is a BMI of 42, 27% excess weight loss represents a significant percent of starting body weight loss of about 13%. So here's data at 12 months, and here's data at 27 months. A significant maintained weight loss. Again, this hasn't come to the U.S. as a pivotal trial, and uh, none of these are FDA approved. Um, until I get to the V-block, which I'll show later. And here's an interesting thing that shows the individual patients and their BMI change. So you can see there's a significant non-responder rate, and then some patients who do really, really well. And that's what we've seen, I think, over and over again with electrical stimulation, is some patients seem to respond, 
and some don't, and maybe some way of understanding who that is would be valuable, but so far I haven't seen anything that really does that well. Um, here's a really interesting device. This is a balanced device for duodenal stimulation. Um, there's two electrodes placed on the surface of the duodenum, and then the communication is just like with all the other devices. And here are the two picture of the two leads placed on the duodenum endoscopy to make sure you haven't perforated. And these leads are less aggressive as far as like those big needles that we used to use. Hopefully, there won't be a lot of perforation. Um, in these 12 patients, um, you can see significant but small decreases in hemoglobin A1C, fasting blood glucose, and improvement in HDL. I mentioned this only because it is electrical stimulation, and people are beginning to talk about deep brain stimulation. You know, leptin signals from fat cells and lots of other signals that come to the brain in various areas that I can't claim to know exactly where they are by a long shot and have long names. But these devices, which have been used for Parkinson's and actually now in severe obsessive compulsive disorder, seem to be able to impact the outcome of decision making um, in some patients. And you wonder whether stimulation like this will actually be able to make people make choices of the apple over the donuts. I'm not sure that's going to work, and it certainly hasn't been done yet. But there are a couple of case reports in the literature of people who have had deep brain stimulation for other reasons, talking about decreasing in appetite and weight loss. Um, hard to know if that's going to pan out. Um, vagal function, um, because we're going to go on to talk about V-block, and that the purported mechanism is vagal blockade. We don't know how much of the previous stuff I showed has anything to do with vagal inputs. Um, because we're stimulating near the vagus nerve a lot of the time. But 10 to 20 percent of the fibers send instructions down to the brain, and 80 to 90 percent sends messages back up to the brain. So there's a lot that probably goes in here from the stomach and gut as far as satiety goes to the brain. Gastric acid secretion of digestive enzymes and emptying motility are the downward signals, and satiety, for the most part, is what goes back up to the brain. This V-Block Maestro device is now FDA approved. The signal generator is very similar, different electrodes. They don't go into the wall of anything, but they sit around the vagal trunk, so you have to dissect out the vagal trunks in order to place them in. And these high frequency signals are supposed to block vagus nerve activity. I don't know if there's an actual measure you can take other than cardiac variability um, to look at vagus nerve blocking. Um, you know, the old tests of Congo red for vagotomy, as far as I know, haven't been done to look at whether we have actually blocked the uh, efferent effects. In any case, these are signaled um, for 12 hours per day during um, awake hours and was FDA approved in January 15. Multicenter controlled trial, that was the pivotal trial in the U.S., and there were two of them. Um, this one had a the recharge trial with, with the device that patients could recharge. Um, a two to one randomization. And after 12 months, it was no longer blinded. So here you can see the outcome for patients. When you're looking at 20% excess weight loss, um, over 50% of patients achieved that. Now, excess weight loss in a group of patients that had a BMI in the 30 to 40 range represents probably less than 10% of their total body weight loss, which is what you see in the range of medications, the best medical management. Um, so that was pretty significant. 50% of patients achieved at least best medical management. When you look at what we might consider, and I hate to use the word, but good outcomes perhaps in surgery, a 50% excess weight loss, that was less than 20% of patients. So again, this is surgery without the anatomic changes, yes, without some of the complications perhaps, um, but not nearly as effective as some of that. Um, in the lower BMI patients, um, maybe you can get these higher excess weight loss, but not dramatically better total body weight loss. Because as you're talking about lighter weight, lower BMI patients, the excess weight is such a small number, even 20 pounds can get you up to 50% excess weight loss. So it, be very careful when you're looking at excess weight loss, you need to look at the BMI of the patients that were involved. And when these were broken down into B lower BMI versus higher BMI patients, it looks really good in lower BMI patients when you look at excess weight loss. Regardless, this is significant sustained weight loss, similar to what was seen in some of the other trials, and like I said, in a different era over 10 years ago that didn't meet muster. Here's the recharge trial at 24 months, and this is the control group regaining weight, and here you can see that the treatment group is maintaining weight, and a 17% absolute difference between the two groups in excess weight loss. This is the trial um, showing both the recharge and the empower trial, similar results. This is just a systematic review, and then I'll be done. 
um, 31 published papers of 33 different trials of all type of gastric stimulation, vagal blocking, et cetera, and so forth. Only four of these were randomized trials. 24 had 30 or fewer subjects, and most of the papers showed some modest weight loss over the short run. We don't have long, long-term data, but bottom line is electrical stimulation continues to develop. Unfortunately, these infinite stimulation parameters means we'll never know for sure that it doesn't work, only that it works modestly is what we know so far. And there is definitely this gap space for efficacious low-risk interventions that patients may choose over something more efficacious that has more risk and uh, long-term downside. I appreciate it.